So this older poem came out of uh, this experience with Charles Olson at the Berkeley Poetry Conference in uh, the 1960s, and uh, it was very uh, sort of generative. It was a very generative experience for me, just watching him kind of play on stage and in a kind of altered state in a community of poets and friends. And I was very magnetized by that energy. Eyes in all heads to be looked out of. Formed a new beast today. Eye of hawk, heart of lion, radar of bat. Cross the psychic threshold, the same old, old set of eyes. So many layers in one way of working, and you, the other, you open every one of them. You make me exist, cold by the doorway, chipper when we don't miss a beat, despondent for heartbreak's sake. I am the weather when it breaks and destroys. Stroke my sleeping fur, appease me, or I'll deracinate your calm. My other has shown his many face, weak, selfish. You see him around women. In college, I was mostly uh, more of what we call official verse culture poets coming out of a tradition more British. Uh, the, the, poem, the verse always looking the same, the stanzas, left-hand margin, and even after Mahler May had expanded the poem you know, and, and the, the page was a kind of field for the poem. You had this, you know, still kind of uh, subject matter poetry. This was a poem about a dead animal. This was a poem about a, your grandmother, you know, very bound by the subject matter and, and often beautifully crafted and so on. But I was not, as a young woman, in um, sort of coming of age in the 60s, feeling a, a different kind of kinetics, a different kind of interest in how the line worked, how things, how things were, uh, could morph together and be cut up, rearranged, repetition, orality, all these things, breath, were coming into, and how did you capture that on the page? How did you also embody it in a performance? The particular reading that's alluded to there with a kind of, uh, you know, shaktipat or, or um, you know, thrill of, of watching somebody in, in kind of embody a new poetics. Um, Charles Olson uh, has a text called Projective Verse that came out of letters with Robert Creeley and so on. So Projective Verse is about the kinetics of the language and a kind of thrust forward, the breath, the uh, sense of proprioception of this knowledge in the body that's not maybe intellectual but more um, instinctive and finding shape. And also Olson in his Maximus poems was like an investigative poet and writing a long, you know, long uh, montaged uh, text that I found very appropriate to my own energy and sense of, uh, of uh, continuity and connectivity. But he was, he was just trying to hold you in, in this spell of uh, his, his speaking and also his actual reading as if he were taking you through the very process of how he had put this together. And, and Olson was onto something. There was some, you know, he was in the, he was in space, kind of uh, drawing on this and that. His mind was uh, wandering, but also very um, logical in some ways. And I thought, this is interesting. And everybody was still there. You know, it wasn't like a boring poetry reading with somebody just droning on. And I was magnetized by this occasion. Well, it had to do with where I wanted to, I was getting out of school soon, where I wanted to be with the poetry world. I wanted to be, my alliance or my allegiance was to this more experimental, open, wild mind poetics. Now on this tarmac outside, get in line. Pick up the weapons, the branches and brushes, the ankhs, the heart sutras, the wheels of time, the precious jewels, the precious ministers, the precious speech. The oppressed and the oppressor can meet at last. And when I heard my old poetry teacher speak, it was like the voice of rain 
and I received it always in the guise of Earth. I mean, a breakthrough book was Fast Speaking Woman, which came out of my interest in shaman work. In um, and I was traveling to. By then, I had gone to. Let's see, I'd been to probably India and South America. I had been. Somebody had played for me the recordings of Maria Sabina, the Mazatec uh, shaman who. Uh, would guide participants into these all-night uh, veledas, where they would ingest the hongos, and she would she had a and, and she was part of a lineage, out of her family and others, who uh, you know took you into a another landscape, and so the fast speaking woman was very inspired and influenced by her, and I incorporate her, her kind of form, her lines, I'm a this woman, I'm a that woman, I'm a fast speaking woman, I'm a rolling speech woman, I'm a white light woman, I'm an amber light woman. And then I would, you know, bring in my own sort of, uh, I know how to work the machines, I hold the keys, I'm traveling all over the, I, whatever. Um, so that form, very simple anaphoric litany form was very, uh, interesting as a in terms of performance just that you know very simple but also uh, allowed for improvisation allowed for a kind of um, a con you know continuity a longer tech a longer time duration um, came back on itself it wasn't resolved it wasn't coming to a beginning middle end it wasn't really subject matter oriented it was more like a you know a um, a um, vision or a uh, alternative experience of being maybe disembodied so that was um, that was that was already in there that you could trust your orality things you were hearing repetitions um, and there were a series of more you know poems I didn't think of particularly for the page there's a piece called crack in the world I see the crack in the world Endometrium shedding. You back off, you men back out of me. I'm in my, this kind of almost uh, performative, but more like a, um, a ritual than a theater. You know, it's, it's more ritualistic. And also being able to switch moods to be able to be singing a lullaby and then go into a, you know, rage. I'm coming up out of the tomb, men of war or mega, 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 mega death pop, enlighten. That was for, you know, protests in uh, the Rocky Flats Plutonium. So some things, because of the uh, call for me to, in agitprop and political work and, and protest out, you know, when artists or poets would take the stage or take the space uh, during protests, there was a kind of call to uh, be very direct and uh, embodying the um, the psychology, d embodying the state of mind of either rage or or uh, mourning and so on. So that seemed to be it, it wasn't compartmentalized, but it was an area of work. As wilderness is my witness, as wildness is my witness, take this vow in wilderness. It is over, gone, and done with, over and done with, being behind the hiddenness of the marriage veil, behind it, a valence, a balance, and what is the essence of this rhythm as in music which knows no boundary? Rip the boundary that is veil when it tunes to the body a beautiful sameness. Civil, civil, it is civil, civil, and a civil right, right, right. It is a demand to be civil as a cascade is civil as from the tilling of fields and this world is a cultivation of new things in civility. It is a sure thing to witness. Well, I'm interested in Sprechstimme. You know, that's Sprechstimme. So the um, almost uh, orality that the words suggest, because it's not as if I'm a trained uh, particular singer or know how opera works. Or, But uh, I have a long piece that I wrote when John Cage died that's in that's in the Eovis trilogy, and it's, Dear John Cage, what time me time? And it you know, goes on through different uh, modes like that. Um, speeds up, I'm trying to think of, there's one, who is a man not caged, 
who is a woman, not worth. Who is a man, not caged. Who is a woman, not worth. Dear John Cage, the world is a more something place. We thank you for it. You know, just being able to go off in an address, it's sort of an ode to him in a way, but trying to play with his, um, when I performed it, I'd like to take an hour and then have other interventions with uh, music. I, a uh, performer used to play un, uh, inside the piano, plucking the piano strings, um, lying on the lying on the ground, playing the piano from below, having people come in and read just a newspaper or read a text of John's. Um, so that sense of creating an open structure that allows for uh, other things to occur. So I try to do that for myself. And in performance, you never know where it's going to go. If you start, you feel like the energy is going down, you jump you know, jump into something else. Do you stalk? Can you heal? Will you climb? What is the link to the link of the trance of the trace of your heat coil? Now you are quick. Soon you will be dead. Ancestor, if roots are rural and you are on the ground barefoot or if they are urban and you bend inwardly your concrete sepulcher, will that help with the ground turning underneath your feet in jungle metaphor? And if the scene changes and suddenly, abruptly, something is riven, imploding rhythm from you then what? A new planet? What is being relational when you hardly know the kinetics of your own chemistry? And where you are from, but you know, goes back, back, way back, back, back with all the other visitors who crowd your head. What will support your mind in the longest, deepest, quivering night you live and notate within and how you will move to caution others, be still, be very still. It's dawn in the adventure, space and time. You're not a soldier. You're not a war correspondent, but you're a field poet. You know, you're, you're kind of um, have to be there as a witness, but it's tr you're translating it. You're not, it's not a literal uh, account. Other people can do that much better, but it's a, a sensory, um, imagistic, uh, tonal uh, kind of uh, response and you know to vocalize the horror of of so much of that's going on or the you know the manatee I thought it was so I've never say fuckers in a poem I mean I've just it's just like it's not on my list but at one point that you know, stupid fuckers, they let the language die, they let the air die, they let the, that's what they'll be saying about us. Hey, wake up. So there's this kind of voice, it's, there's humor in it, but it's also deadly serious, and it's also just trying to, you know, shake, shake myself, shake myself. Now represent your representations in the symbolic code of language, manatee, humanity, and run your hand along the restless spine. It was a time of fossil fuel priorities, a precious business time. That's what they'll say about us centuries hence. It was a busy, get on with it, business time. So you better get on with it time. They fucked us over in their greedy get over it time. That's what they'll be saying about us. What were they thinking, stupid fuckers? It was commodification time, fun hog time, time modification time, got on with time. We killed time. They screwed us over in our future time. We'll be surely more stressed in time. There's often this uh, page and stage. Is it, you know, for the page, you know, where did poetry come from? And it's a very silly old uh, debate or it's not even a debate in my mind I mean yes things came from birdsong we all came from birdsong and then uh, um, and then you can you know separate out the Greek you know view of it was all one so you had the visual the mask the representation the performance the chorus the choral ode came out of this performance mode and you strophes and the anti strophes and a chorus and in fact, even when I read a book of poems, but just by myself in an isolated space, it's a it's a performance in my 
imagination. They mess the world over in their sweet, avaricious time frame. That's what they'll say about us. They let the animals die. They let the plants die. They kill the air. They kill the water. They killed each other. They killed language. Hum, drum, paleolithic, where we could talk in sweet time notches. Well, that's over. Where did that ever evolve to? Then along 20,000 years of keeping time once, keeping it for all and moving it time forward and it the art forward and it humanity forward. And now they want to kill it. Really, they kill it. Poetry's not going to die. I mean, I have this slogan, keep the world safe for, for poetry. Poetry has been around. It predates religion, uh, the orality of, of making sound and noise and song and movement and gesture, communicating through this stuff. Um, I'm glad that people are poets, whatever their kind of poetry or ilk or just that they've um, worked with language and worked with ideas and words. Sometimes if it's very complacent or, or uh, you know, kind of privileged in a way, it's not as attractive to me, but I, I admire that this is, you know, your mind can, can go into uh, a kind of discipline of making something with language that you can only communicate in that way. It's not trying to be anything, really. And I think that was what attracted me originally in, in Berkeley, seeing this community where people were working. And it was a more, you know, 60s where we, hadn't, we weren't on the internet. We weren't on cell phones. We were not on screens in this way. We were, um, you know, working very closely or closer to the bone, closer to the ground. And I've tried, and I'm grateful for the time I was born in. Um, you know, I love thinking, I mean, with all the troubles of the wars, et cetera, you know, just it felt more authentically uh, direct. You could be your regular person and you could relate to the common, you know, human, your common humanity. With Burroughs, yeah, hey, with Ginsburg, yeah, hey, I sang a lump little fellow and to the curandero sang and sang. Maestro jungle outskirts Pucalpa behind the gaswork field, talks a lot the power of the curing, cooks the universe together, curing, 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 talks a lot the drink, the hold it together, drinking, ah, woo, ah, woo night drinking session power curing strains the broth but an outskirt sincere in drug scape Ramon came over to the hut crooning and a blowing a fresh batch and blowing cigarette smoke and pipe smoke and over the cup mouth I roll oh, oh, 